All right. How are you today, Stephen? Fantastic, Katie, darling. Are you excited for 3D experience? You yes, sir. First, happy 420 day. <gasps> oh, <laughs> I wasn't ready for this. What yes. Are you uh, well, today is uh, 420 and Taco Tuesday. So in my family, we are going to have tacos. So um, excellent. Yeah, excellent. Just being silly. Um, but yeah, it's a special day for a lot of people. So. Well, you know why it's a special day for us, Katie? Because we're going to talk about this awesome uh, 3D sculptor role that I am in love with. Exactly. It speaks to my inner designer. I want to yeah, be a designer. I, I, well, it speaks to my inner child. See, I love, I love playing yeah. with my So <laughs> for me, being able to, uh, to do that is, is a benefit. And, and you get paid for it. You know, it's, yeah. it's a feature. <laughs> Uh, so then, let's let's get kicking. So, uh, of course, guys, we're jumping into the 3D Experience platform, and today's topic, we're going to be looking at advanced part design, specifically as it relates to non-standard geometry. So, we've all made squares and cubes and everything inside of SolidWorks, but the 3D Experience platform gives us access to more tools, including a tool called X-Shape, or uh, 3D Sculptor, whatever you want to call it these days. And so we're going to be going through the process of designing parts using the platform. So as a brief introduction, I'm Steven. Uh, if you've been following any of the webinars we've been doing over the past, oh, you know, six, eight months now, you've probably seen me here. And I'm really in love with the 3D experience platform. I'm using it daily. And so I'm here me to show you how it works and how to kind of streamline your workflows. Katie, we do need to get you a new picture. I'm calling it. Really? Well, I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I'll work on it because it's just, yeah, it's old. It's an old one. Um, but yeah, I'm loving the platform too, using it daily. And I just really like the fact that um, it's all in one place. You know, I used to send emails to, you know, my colleagues, where's this? How do I find that? And it's just, it's so easy to share information and have everything in one place. All right, so this I know this is your favorite slide to talk about, so I'll, I'll give you the reins on this one. And it's not from the Titanic, that's that's for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Did you see that Saturday Night Live uh, skit with the iceberg on the news? No? Okay, I'll have to send it no, to you. But, uh, it was so funny. Whoops. Sorry, I lost my headset. Um, <laughs> but yeah, this, this is a cool slide to just really focus in on the costs associated with on-premise software as opposed to using the cloud um, you know there's a lot of underlying costs and you know when you start to look at especially if you're a startup um, you know funds are hard to come by so um, you think oh I'm just buying software well no you've got to, you know IT you've got hardware maintenance training all those those underlying costs so this is a great slide to reference that yeah and it's it's one of those it, it answers the the question that keeps you up at night, or at least it keeps me up at night, is you know how how do people justify the switch from on-premise to on-cloud solutions? I mean, I dream about that. I don't know about mm -hmm. you, but uh, yeah, that's, yeah that's but really it seems like a no-brainer for a startup. But you're right. If I'm a, you know, I've been ticking along here for five years, got a pretty successful company. Why would I want to go to the cloud? And hopefully, after seeing the sculptor role today, you'll be like, give me that. But if you haven't been keeping up with all of our fun then I would highly, highly recommend checking out the webinars. Uh, I listed a couple, but there's a ton of different 3D experience-based webinars over on our GoTo stage. You can go ahead and uh, scan that QR code or we'll paste that over in chat as we get going here. But the idea is that there's a ton of content. You're not going to learn everything you need to know about the cloud in one sitting. It is a giant platform, but we break it into bite-sized pieces to figure out which tools you need in order to be successful with what you're currently doing. So check this out. You can see uh, both Katie and myself go through our learning experience as we dive into the platform from some of the super basic lessons up until some of the more complex on engineering and data management. So lots of variety, a little bit for everyone. And today's going to be joining that, that grouping. Now, 
here's the fun part. Let's see where everyone's at. So I'm going to kick it over to a poll here. And let's see if I can do this correctly this time. I'm going to go ahead and launch a poll. And so everyone who is currently watching should be seeing the poll. And if they're not, well, I tried. But uh, first one, looking at whether or not you've used SolidWorks to make organic shapes. So have you used SolidWorks surfacing? Have you used a different product to make organic shapes? You know, where is everyone in terms of their experience? Actually, Katie, what, what would you answer, yes or no? Uh, I would say no, but um, I also got to play with the surfacing tool, um, with the, the sculpture tool. So I feel like um, I'm a mix between yes, or yes, I've tried surfacing tools, but using the one that we've seen today. So that we're ah, schooling exactly. today. Well, and this is, and this next question is definitely an auxiliary to uh, the first one. So how familiar are you with sub-D modeling? Katie, what is sub-D modeling? Uh, sub-D modeling, it's funny. I actually um, looked that up before um, <laughs> we, we, we got on because there was a question I was gonna ask you before, but the, everybody was talking. Um, but it's, you know, divides, it's it, it's a curved surface represented by a specific specification of coarser mesh. And I, it was my, my question to you was, um, is the mesh that's in the sub in the 3D sculptor is it better than the the mesh when we use our regular surfacing tools at SolidWorks? And sorry if I'm jumping ahead, but wow. Well, let me let me write for you prepare a uh, full description in a one hour webinar to go through that. Yeah. Oh, here we are. No, but the the short answer is yeah. It's basically a way to generate C2 continuity, which is curves that look good. For, for the average person, when you talk about surfacing, there's a bunch of crazy terminology. But long story short, you can say curves that look good, that's sub-D. And it looks like most of our attendees have at least seen sub-D modeling, but kind of on the same boat as you, Katie, and you haven't really messed around with it. And that's totally fair. Because in SolidWorks, making pretty shapes is kind of hard. It, it takes a bit of effort, a bit of time. Yeah. It's, a, it's definitely a technique that some of my customers have come to our training to get better at. And that's why I'm excited to show them this because it, it's so easy. I have to keep saying that, but it is it's, uh, when you get to see it in action. It really is easy. And, and what I really enjoy about sub -D modeling is it's a lot more intuitive for, let's say, non-mechanically minded individuals. So industrial designers have a much easier time using sub -D modeling in order to generate and create shapes based off of images rather than, say, uh, trying to do surfacing, and it, it, it takes a lot of effort to make the same shape. You also get better results. So the example you're looking at here, in general, when we talk about a SolidWorks component or any CAD modeler, you're working with NURBS surfaces, which are based off of a specific set of math or equations to generate your geometry. The downside is when you create those, you get these kind of weird lumpy areas. It's it's hard to make things look really good, really smooth. And you can do it. You just spend the time and energy to make it happen. Whereas with sub -D modeling, it's all inherently involved in the package. So I'll, I'll show you what I mean as we go through, because honestly, you have to kind of see it and play around with it to get a grasp on it. So yeah. the plan for today, and of course, I forgot to mention, bad, bad on me here, if you have any questions or comments or funny jokes go ahead and just post them in chat and we'll we'll circle back to them or incorporate them in as we go but we're going to be going through a couple steps in advanced part design so we'll start out with collaboration on the cloud start with an initial sub d model move over and into solidworks to parametrically model jump back to the cloud to do design changes or updates. Wow. And then we'll wrap it up with just making some drawings, the typical end to any design workflow. So full plate today, let's buckle up and get going and check out cloud collaboration on the 3D Experience platform. You ready, Katie? I am ready. That's a lot. Okay. It is a lot. So I don't know we we're going to go back and forth, but cool. Yeah, jumping into the platform here, we have the ability to collaborate using the 3D Swim communities. And in this case, we're collaborating about taking a electric carving knife and converting it over to being driven by a battery. So rather than having it attached to a cord, 
the team can collaborate back and forth on ideas to you know create this part. You can take inspiration from other parts that exist. You can uh, make ridiculous jokes, whatever you usually do in order to collaborate with your team. So maybe we don't need to make something quite as ridiculous, but we are going to be able to convert a previously existing design over into a battery powered USB-C uh, cutting knife. So we create a task using the to-do in order to basically assign a job to someone. So, you know, you never want to be in a situation where you're trying to collaborate and you don't know who's working on what. So in this case, we're just going to drag and drop that carving knife directly from the cloud into our SolidWorks. So this is your typical uh, Eric Engineers, the SolidWorks user. He loves using SolidWorks. And in this case, you're able to collaborate directly with the uh, your SolidWorks users in a way that is very familiar if you've ever used PDM. So you have a full data management system, a PLM system even, where you can check in, edit, and work on your individual parts. In our case here, we're going to reserve this component. That way we know nobody else is editing it and that we are able to make the changes we need to to create the new revision. And we're going to go ahead and save this carving knife with a new revision. So going from Rev A to Rev B so that we have a new design. You know, when you're changing it to a battery pack from an electric cord, it's definitely deserving of a new revision. And so now we're working off the Rev B and we're gonna set up a collaborative task. The idea of collaborative tasks is that you can assign roles and responsibilities to individuals, uh, as well as let people know where you are in the process. So in this case, uh, we're gonna move that over to in work to indicate to the team, I'm working on this right now, it's in process. You don't need to send me an email or a, a ping me on Teams in order to figure out where we're at, we're working on it. We'll go ahead and hide that component and we're gonna go find a battery. And using the platform search capabilities, we can limit our search to find a USB-C battery pack and preview directly inside of that 3D experience window. So this is a really nice and easy way in order to determine whether or not uh, this is the component you're looking for. You're not browsing through a bunch of Windows files. And we just drag and drop that directly into SolidWorks. So super intuitive, super easy to do. Uh, same thing like you always do with SolidWorks. We can go ahead and mate that into the correct position and we can continue on our design. So we've updated the design, but you know maybe something's not quite right with this knife right now. We'll go ahead and save it to the cloud. That's gonna make sure that anyone else who accesses this assembly is going to have the most up-to-date version. We'll go ahead and reserve the file. That way we have ownership of it and then we'll release it again so that you know, when we need to make changes, i.e. when we need to add a new handle, then it's gonna be easy to do. All right, so I'm no expert in cut, uh, cutting utensils, but this doesn't look quite right. Maybe <laughs> maybe we should be making a couple adjustments here, uh, but, but that's not my job. I'm gonna send that over to the industrial designer. I'm gonna create a new collaborative task and we're going to make someone else design the handle. And so designing the handle, that's going to be a task that has a description with information about what needs to happen. Uh, we can set its current maturity state so that it needs to be done. We can set the amount of time, probably shouldn't take more than two hours. We can tag someone to the person doing the work, obviously. Dan designer, yeah. Yeah, get Dan Designer in here, make him deal with the, the curvy stuff. And then finally, we're going to attach the document. And the big benefit here is that you're not looking for files anywhere. You're not attaching files to an email. Instead, you're creating a link directly to the platform. So you always have the most up-to-date data. You're never working with an old file. And so here, even though we were back in the cloud, what we draw, dragged in earlier, you'll notice that we have the ability to mark up this updated model. So we'll create a quick markup, point out where the changes happen, even though if you can't see that, you're probably blind. Um, and go ahead and add any types of notes or clarification just to make everyone's life easier. And with that, we take it, publish it back into that SWIM community. So the idea that we want the team to know what's going on, not only the task uh, for Dan, but we want the whole team to understand where we're at in the process so that there's none of this guessing and we have no idea uh, who's doing what. All of that solved and over back in the uh, SWIM community, we have the more casual communication 
to go ahead and let Dan know that, yep, we have a picture of it. We're off to the races in terms of what he needs to do. So step one done. We did the typical collaboration. We saved our parts. The parts are stored in the cloud. And if you want to know more about that type of interaction, uh, so tasks, we have a project planner webinar we did that we spent an hour talking specifically about assigning tasks. Uh, we have another one about specifically data management and PLM. So there's a ton more information there. Uh, we're just trying to keep it kind of brief so that we get to the fun part, which is playing with the X axis. Yes. All right, now for the fun part, now for the reason I'm here, and that's to do the sub D modeling. So sub D modeling is extremely fun and very easy compared to your typical SOLIDWORKS design, but that doesn't make it any less relevant. So in this case, we're jumping over to Dan, the designer, who's gonna go ahead and see that Eric sent him over a mention, indicating that, yep, there's a task to do. He can go into his collaborative tasks and goes ahead, sets it to in work so that the whole team knows he's working on it. And he can just drag and drop that knife over into his cloud window to work on. So no, he's completely in a browser. He could be on an iPad, he could be on any device he wants, a Mac, it doesn't matter, he's working on the cloud. And so go ahead, get rid of this old, uh, not so useful part. And we're gonna create our new shape for our handle. And in this case, it's gonna be pretty easy to design this shape because luckily uh, we went ahead and generated an image or a picture of the handle of, you know, we ran it through some focus groups. We had our industrial designer draw it out and it's as easy as choosing the file and uploading it, selecting whatever plane you wanna drop it onto. And then we can easily scale using on-screen points. So you don't have to have a bunch of guesswork. You don't need to know uh, how many DPI or at what scale the image was at originally. None of that shenanigans. You can literally drag and drop individual points and say, okay, from my left edge of my part over to the right edge is 200. You know, that's the information we have on the picture. That's how we want to scale it. And we're just going to drag it into its position. So a lot easier than, you know, conventionally working off of images. Now we're going to start with the primitive. The primitives are the base components inside of X shape or 3D sculptor. And the idea is that we're going to take this ball of basically faces, a ball of surfaces that are divided ball of clay. into basically <laughs> a ball of clay. I mean, yeah. or Play Doh, whatever you want to call it. And we're going to split that into the number of faces we need to get the job done. So, in our case, when you're working with this type of setup, less is usually more. You start out with less and then you add some more later. And we're just going to do a drag functionality by just highlighting the points that we wanna work with. And we're just gonna drag them using the arrow key, using the robot effector, which we'll talk about a little bit more later. And we just so drag easy. it over there. Look at that. Oh yeah, it's super easy. And you know what, you wanna add more loops. You don't have enough loops for what you wanna do. You're gonna hit the insert loops button and select where you wanna add the loops. So in this case, we wanna make more changes. We want more flexibility. We can set up the correct number of loops we want. In this case, we'll say, okay, two loops. And if we want to loop back on the back end and you're used to SOLIDWORKS, which has that in context menu that'll pop up right under your keyboard with whatever you want to do next or your mouse, not under your keyboard, that wouldn't make any sense. But in this case, you're able to insert the loop directly in one click. So once you know what you want to do, it's really fast to use or removing loops. So you're just hitting delete and that's going to do the same functionality as in SOLIDWORKS where you're going to go ahead and delete that feature itself. All right, now we can toy around with so the transparency cool. and see what's going on in our assembly and our sketch in order to get our shape to be the way we want it to. Now, of course, you wanna go ahead and turn on symmetry and that's gonna make sure that the right and left sides look the same because as much fun and just as dragging things around randomly is, we wanna make sure that it is aesthetically pleasing. We wanna make sure that we have a symmetry around that center plane. Uh, question, what if I didn't, um turn that on and I just kept modeling, is it is there like a mirror command to just, or do I have to go back and, you know what I'm Actually, saying? If, if you don't turn it on and then you realize, oh, down the road, oops, I wanted to mirror or I wanted symmetry, it's really easy because when you turn on the mirror command and the sides aren't mirrored, it asks you which side you'd want to face your mirror. <laughs> off. So rather Very than even cool. having to go and do an, an extra command, it's just part of the symmetry command. 
Cool. Thank you. And it'll give you a visual display of both. Yeah, it's really convenient. All right. Here, creasing edges. Yes, we are trying to get that fancy G2 continuity here, but we want things to look fierce. We want them to look sharp. And a lot of times what we need to do is create hard corners or hard edges. Uh, and here we're just using some selection tricks in order to select entire loops at once rather than having to uh, select manually every single edge, similar to some of the tools inside of SolidWorks, to get those creases. Now, that would have taken a good amount of time in SolidWorks to do, totally. let alone subdividing faces. So in terms of what we want to accomplish, subdividing faces creates more faces where you take that initial face and you make a smaller version and add four more surrounding faces that are adjacent and C2 continuous. This is how you get into more detail, how to edit specific areas, and without messing up your continuity. Whereas in SolidWorks, if you try and make changes like this on the fly, it's a little sticky. You have to be very careful. Right. But it's hard to, it's pretty much hard to break this stuff here. Uh, so in our That's case, <laughs> It's it's really, really convenient, especially when you just want to select a bunch of faces. You can just select uh, or utilize the selection tools to select a specific area. So in our case, we're going to just select all the faces. And notice using the box select, we can just grab all the top. Now notice here, if we were to have said OK, we actually selected the faces on the top and bottom. So we'll use an option to select only the visible elements. Sometimes you want to grab elements you can't see, sometimes you don't. That's why we have a toggleable box. And so in this case, we'll grab those top edges and we're going to go ahead and insert an extra uh, component here or extra faces so that we can work with them. And we'll go ahead and even add a crease or a hard edge in order to replicate that uh, 3D model or that sketch as we go about it. And we'll switch back to being able to work with any entities. Now, Katie, what is the number one complaint about sub -D modeling? You know? uh, is, does it have to do with the mesh and having a really super fine mesh to get d deeper into the details? Oh, that is a good guess. I would say that's probably number two. Number one okay. is the ability to be accurate. So sub -D modeling has this funny stigma that, oh, you can't make parts the size that you want to make them, or, oh, you can't match your dimensions that you need. It's just simply not true. So in this case, we can actually edit the entire bounding box in order to make sure that the part size fits the part we wanted to produce. Okay. Well, that makes sense. Yeah. So in this case, being able to scale things in a non-uniform fashion gives that flexibility of uh, working with your model and creating geometry that matches the parts you want to fabricate and basically matches what you would be doing in SolidWorks. Mm -hmm. uh, and so here we got it to the right size. We can move that to the, to the correct position, return on that mirror. Want to make sure that's symmetrical across that center plane here. And now it's time to do a little bit of editing. And this is where the bread and butter of sub D modeling is. Look how easy it is to grab faces, yeah. and shift them around. This is not something that you could conventionally do in SolidWorks, or at least not, not easily whatsoever. Yeah, it does take effort. And so this is sped up slightly, but the idea is that uh, you know, you're know you spending way less time than you would conventionally in order to move each and every one of these points to the right position in order to match your image or match your geometry. As you can see, we can see the components underneath. and the cool piece here is if you've ever worked with a sub D modeler before, when you want things to be lined up on an individual edge, conventional sub D modelers have trouble with this. But using uh, X design or X shape here in this case, we're going to align these edges. That's going to create a flat surface that you can sketch on. And that's a really big deal. That's not something that is very common. So if you notice here, we can snap Whoa. it vertically. And that's going to create a flat surface that's sketchable inside of SolidWorks, which is, that's a huge deal. Uh, if you want curvy stuff, you know, you don't have to just draw a straight line. Instead, we can align things based or align points and segments based off of a drawing. So here, I'm going to go ahead and select the quick align 
and just sketch in the shape that we want. And you can do it a few times so you get something that you prefer. And then you can use that as your basis to then drag and drop and get everything in the correct position. So you're not limited to the same kind of features that you would be inside of a SolidWorks conventional tree. Instead, you know, you're just going and making your component on the fly how you want it to be shaped. Now from the top here, we've been focusing on the side. The top looks a little funny. So we can go ahead and scale these inward. The idea being that we want it to have a little bit of form so that it right. looks- Right, you wrap your hand around it. Exactly, we don't want it to be completely uh, oval. That doesn't make any sense. And then on top of that, if we go and look at the front here, we wanna go ahead and create a contoured look. And so we can actually use the angled segment of the robot arm in order to adjust the angle of that cylinder face. So in this oh, case, we okay. can rotate it around, we can bring it back in order to get that vibe we want. So it's really all about moving your different parts and faces to create the geometry you want. Or in this case, we wanna make that trigger or the, the finger holder here. And so we wanna add a, a 3D shape, right? We wanna split faces, but we don't want it to just be flat. We want it to stick out a little bit. So right. right on the cursor, you have that extrude feature. You're able to activate that and we can globally scale that down. So by selecting the face, holding Alt and dragging in, we can scale how that surface is created and rotate that in until we match the shape we're trying to accomplish here. And it's a lot of just little movements to get things in the right position, but these adjustments are super quick in order to create something that is a pretty non-traditional shape. Mm -hmm. That's really nice. Yeah, definitely. And uh, Katie, I'm sure you've seen enough SolidWorks to know doing doing this in SolidWorks would would have taken a good chunk of time. That's for sure. Takes a lot of time. Um, the other thing too, like if I had one of those cool touch screen, like if I'm doing it on my iPad, it's really easy to. Or if I had the pen, I'm just thinking that might be. Yeah, absolutely. Even, all, all again, my inner designer out. thinks it would be fun to sketch and push and pull and all that. So. Exactly, all of the cloud apps are oh touch enabled and you have all your fun tools like zebra stripes in order to look at the curvature. And we can see that we have C2 continuity wherever we didn't add a crease, where we added a mm -hmm. crease, then we go down to C1 continuity just like we designed it to. And now once that's saved, we can go ahead and let uh, Eric the engineer know that his fancy 3D shape is completed and it's time for him to integrate that directly into the SolidWorks system. All right, so you're saving it in the cloud, and now Eric's taking control. Exactly. So the model's up to date, the sub D model's corrected, and now it's time to bring it back into SolidWorks and to work with that geometry in our typical parametric modeling approach. So we're inside SolidWorks, and we're going to go ahead and we're gonna kick off that collaborative task. We see that there's an update. Uh, if we wanted to, he could have attached the data or we can even search for it ourselves. And so here we're using an approach that's similar to like a master modeling technique, if you've ever done that. The idea being that we're going to have this 3D shape control uh, how our SolidWorks part called new handle looks. We'll go ahead and add a shell feature. This is gonna be injection molded. So we'll wanna make sure that we're able to shell that out. We can also go in and edit the part in context. So now we're editing the part while in the assembly in order to add the appropriate cutout. This cutout will uh, allow for the blade to make it through the front of the face. And we're sketching on that face created within the uh, X shape software. So no, no issues in terms of creating a truly flat face. And this is something that is very cool if you're coming from say Rhino where that is just not possible. Yes, Rhino. Exactly. And we can go here and, you know, go ahead and split the part just like we would be working in any conventional SolidWorks workflow uh, in order to get our plastic parts hide off the side. And let's say that we're going to go in and we're going to add the mounting holes for these brackets. So 
Here we're just going to use convert entity in order to generate a sketch on the back side of the bracket to create the plastic components going up to our part or up to next, basically. Using draft angle and thin feature so that these would be injection moldable and we'd have a place to attach our components. And this, these are the pieces or the components that are really important for true design because now we want to see whether or not there's any interference between my design, my cool sub D model, and we see there is, and the different edges and components inside the motor or inside the battery. So Ooh. we see here that, you know, good first try, but we can do better. You know, we, we have some issues and we're going to bounce it back over into uh, Dan's ballpark, right? So we're going to bounce back over to Dan and say, hey, still some interferences. Dan could have actually checked for interferences using X design, but he chose not to. Uh, you know, he's he's living he's a designer. life. He's a free spirit. Yeah, exactly. He, he wants to feel the shape. He doesn't care about yeah. the interferences like the rest of us. So long story short, because he's a free spirit, we're bouncing it back to him to fix that. Yeah. And so now it's time to update the shape. But not only did... Uh, Dan want to fix the evident issues, but he also wants to make it look cooler, more fierce. And so he's going to jump in again with the collaborative tasks. We can see the back and forth, the conversation. We can see that inside of the handle. We're going to just jump right back into that geometry we're editing. We could have reopened the part or anything we wanted to, and we're going to work to fix this up. So just some slight adjustments to start moving in so it's a bit wider, so we're no longer crashing into that edge. We can go on and make the edits with relation to either the selection, so those arrows are normal to the actual surface, or using the XYZ plane, the idea being that we can change which direction we're pulling with regards to, even more control. And now here's where he gets himself in a little bit of trouble. So we're going to make it more fierce. We're going to make it slanted, which means we got to move this back a little bit. Mm, you know, this, we is, asked what, for it. this is what yeah. the people want. And you know what? Let's just bend the back handle. We don't want this to be more or less straight. We want it to be curved so it's more convenient. So we just select the advanced bend tool, select the location of where we want to start the bend. And so we're going to deviate from the initial straight feature and we're going to just bend it. <laughs> so we're, we're quite literally just changing the geometry on the fly in any way we want to look cooler, to look better, to be better. And you know what's awesome is that none of these changes are going to break the, the file. All of this is going to be available downstream for use. It's going to allow you to continue with your SolidWorks changes and features that we made, such as the mounting holes. And we can even run draft analysis to make sure that this is manufacturable. So the idea here is that we want to check and make sure that there's at least one degree of draft so that when you're looking down from the top, uh, you don't see the bottom side of our, uh, of our component. And what's cool is that you can just leave it active and actually make the changes on the fly. So we're changing the shape while we're getting live feedback of the draft angle. And if we were to split it down the middle, which is probably how this is going to get fabricated, we can see that we're in the clear, that all of those faces are easy to make and we'll have the appropriate amount of draft. And we're done. That's for injection molding, right? The draft exactly. is important. So just making sure that it's as fun yeah. as it looks, it's also manufacturable. And so here, save the part and take a good note of what it looks like. We have that slanted forward face. It is very different than the original part. And if cool. you are used to solid works, you'd be a little worried right now. Maybe a little bit a little bit scared that conventionally a change like that is going to significantly break your file. But not today. Because of the way everything is linked together, because of the way that everything is going to automatically update, the whole process is super easy. So going in and updating the carving knife, you can see that okay, there's been an update to the file. There's a file indicator there in orange. And we're just going to reload the file from the server and go from our original vertical model. It's going to go ahead and update and push through those different features. And boom, you have your new updated handle. And that that's it. That's all you had to do. So you don't have to go fix anything. All your features are still there. You still have 
your cutout, you still have those features on the internal side for mounting. Nothing's broken. And we can go and kick off the drawing. The idea being that you're ready to jump into manufacturing, into creating the part without any holdups because of, you know, the whooshy nature of the component. So just to go back, you know how Eric Engineer had an issue and sent it back to Dan. Could he, if he was kind of savvy with the sculptor tools in SolidWorks, go in and just tweak it? Oh, definitely. Not break it? Okay. Oh, yeah. That's He'd be able to open up the X design and go in and make the adjustments to it. Well, not X design. I'm talking about the sculptor tools inside his SolidWorks. Or X, sorry, X shape. Well, no. So the, the tools inside of SolidWorks are designed for the more parametric modeling. Okay. So those would be more of your typical surfacing you're more you you could directly edit it uh however you have a, a lot more in terms of shape design tools inside of the platform so if you're i mean if you're doing something small like offsetting a face or just making a cutout or anything right. along those lines you do that in solidworks no problem okay and so once the drawing's done you just save that into the cloud and we're ready to go to market with our new awesome looking uh, electric knife handle that is a beautiful thing so here we'd be finally able to go ahead and finish off that project attach the deliverables so that anyone who is looking in the future can see what was actually created or generated from platform uh, and then we're done with the project so the idea is we can add the updates go ahead and let eric know go ahead and let megan know okay we're done the drawings attached and we're we're good to go. We just created a part in way less time than it would be conventionally. Uh, and a part that, again, is not very convenient to make inside of a typical uh, surface model design. Beautiful. All right, so to recap, going through the workflow of an advanced part, you're not just uh, you know, an individual engineer in a silo. But that being said, if you are someone who is walking your components through the entire design process, there's no reason that one person wouldn't be able to do everything that we went through today. You can mm -hmm. quite literally have your own SolidWorks and have your own 3D experience platform where you're using the cloud tools to do the things that the cloud tools are best at. So with XShape, you're able to create sub D modeling in a way that's not necessarily the, you know, the the cornerstone of what SolidWorks does. And by bringing them back and forth, you're saving to the cloud, you have a backup of your data, and you always are going to be on the most recent version when you're working with your files, which makes it very easy to design. I have a question. Yes. So uh, I'm just thinking about, you know, if people wanted to try this, um, giving them access, would they need that connector for SolidWorks, the UES role, or does the sculptor role get rid of that? Like you don't have to buy that extra role. Do you know what I mean? So you need the Right. So what's cool is there's there's several ways to try it out. So inherently, when you if if you were to purchase X shape, you do get the connector. To okay, SolidWorks. that's what I wanted to know. So I don't have to okay. No. So cool. so basically you you get the uh, the ability to link up your software, your SolidWorks, to the cloud. You can also try out XShape for free on the cloud. So since it's a completely cloud-based application, if you just wanted to try XShape uh, or, or 3D Sculptor, uh, it's all the same package. If you wanted to try those together, then you would be able to use uh, that software without having to dive into the connection between them. So it, it's really easy to try out to see whether or not it would fit uh, your needs in terms of surfacing and advanced part design. Yeah, and and anybody listening to this in the recording, um, just shoot us an email, shoot me an email, and I can send you that link to try it for free. Um, and then I also think it's cool too that they have that the deal going on where um, you can use any of the roles of the platform for free. Uh, you just need the collaborative business innovator just to get in. So. Uh, for three months, give it a try, try them all out. Um, I think I love that. A lot and of people have taken advantage of that, for sure. Really easy and convenient to use since you get access to the tools that you need inside the platform. 
uh, in, in this case, expanding the platform, not only to have the connected apps, but to connect your conventional apps like DraftSide or SolidWorks or simulation to the cloud so that you can leverage those cloud tools. Even if you're more comfortable using your desktop software, no worries, you get to continue using that. Uh, but it's just adding the additional tools and even linking up to tools that, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do conventionally like Inventor or PTC Creo. Right. And then of course you have your 100% cloud apps. And then that's really what we focused on today was the idea of X shape and the idea that you can design those sub D models on the cloud and then you can use them in your desktop. You could use them only on cloud. You have all that flexibility, but X shape itself can run out of a browser or any, any tablet really. Any tablet. Yeah. I love it. All right. Well, that's it from my end. So any questions from your end, Katie, as we start to wrap things up? Any questions from the audience? Well, no, I, I think you sort of answered the, the first one where I was curious about this, you know, the differentiator between the surfacing tools found in my desktop SOLIDWORKS as opposed to the sculptor role. You hit that. Um, it looks like that whole mesh thing, it's, it's actually a lot easier um, to create as you can get as in depth or as wide as you want, you know, creating, um, I can't remember what you called it, but Clicking the different window. continuity, yeah. The idea that yes. you can, you you always the shape you create is always going to be watertight. That's the term a lot of people like to use when you're watertight. talking about a mesh or or when you're talking about a surface that's going to build correctly. That's not going to give you errors, and it's surprisingly hard to get that. And you know that's something that when you generate your geometry with X shape it's always going to pass your import diagnostic, so to say. Uh -huh. You're always gonna have a usable surface. That's very cool. Very, very cool. Awesome. Yeah, and like, like I said, if anybody wants to give it a try for free, we can send you links or we can get you set up for a, a three month trial if you wanna dig into all the roles. So very good, this was fun. All right, well, uh, fantastic, thanks Katie. And then, uh, Tune in next month for the next episode of the <laughs> Solid Experience Series. Awesome. Thank you, Stephen. Happy 420. Wait. <laughs> Have a great day, Katie. <laughs>